meet up. Uh, I see a few folks who are jumping in now. Um, so as folks start to trickle in, we just wanted to get things started. So this is one of our first virtual meetups for Pi Data Boston. Um, so fortunately, as much as we'd all love to kind of be with Ben in person, going, uh, having him lead us through this, we are doing this online. Uh, so definitely um, big shout out to Ben for being able to do this and put this all together. Uh, we just want to give a little bit more information about Pi Data. Um, and so uh, we're a community in Boston that uh, is supporting the bigger Pi Data organization, just bringing people together to um, work uh, on different data challenges, as well as be able to share best practices and really share knowledge across um, all different types of experience levels uh, to continue to really build a community here in the Boston area um, around Python and other open source tools. I know we've had a few uh, folks who have jumped on and been connected with us in person, but as we can see on the screen now, um, definitely uh, on the meetup page, make sure you're joining, um, follow us on um, hashtag on Twitter, the Pi Data site, which um, has a lot of information about all the other Pi Data chapters across the US. Uh, definitely stay connected with there. And lastly, we just wanna to touch base on the uh, code of conduct. So I know a lot of you folks who have been here in person, who have been able to uh, come to our events, uh, realize that we're part of the um, bigger Pi Data num focus organization. We want to make sure that um, overall everyone is respectful and really supports each other within the community and, and also understanding that, um, again, this is uh, an organization that we just wanna make sure that everyone feels welcomed um, and inclusive. And so uh, definitely trying to be mindful of that one last thing we want to um, jump on is that we're always looking for folks to volunteer. Uh, definitely need people to put, to get, put together events here. Uh, definitely looking for speakers for the next couple of virtual events. Uh, right now, we don't have um, uh, venues or, or food or partnerships that we're, that we're looking for at the moment, but definitely stay connected with us uh, if you are interested in any of those areas where we're still active and trying to set things up. Uh, at some point when we all are in person and able to uh, meet up, which is definitely something we're looking forward to. And uh, Pi Data site for the Pi Data Boston community, that'll definitely be up uh, with something that we've been working on over the last couple of months, but definitely, definitely stay active in the Slack channel. Uh, there's a lot going on there within the Boston, Pi Data Boston meetup, as well as different uh, or, uh, organizers who are sharing information there. So if you're interested in organizing and, and wanting to volunteer, definitely get on that Slack channel. Uh, in addition to that, we're, we're able to also kind of collect different folks who are interested in presenting as well. So uh, definitely, definitely uh, get on that Slack channel. And before I kick things off to Ben, do want to give a shout out to uh, our next, um, our next meetup, which we're gonna have in June, uh, it's already been posted and shared out, so definitely stay connected. Take a look at that. We have Causal Modeling and Machine Learning uh, by Robert Ness, and this is gonna be happening next in June, uh, next month. So uh, be on the lookout for that if you haven't already joined. Stay tuned for a Zoom link coming. But without further ado, we're all here for Ben Petorsky, who was able to put together this awesome um, workshop on NLP basics. So I will not keep anything uh, from him at this point. I'll pass it over to him and let him give you a brief introduction as well as uh, take you through the workshop. Awesome. Thanks, Ben. Thanks so much, Tyler. Yeah, thanks for taking us through that. Really excited to be having this event. Really like uh, to echo what Tyler was saying. It would be great uh, if, you know, we could all be in person. I'll be sharing, you know, like uh, stories and, and be having our, our networking session here. Um, but I mean, it's great that people are available and, and people can, can join us in this in this time, and uh, yeah, that we can continue to build a community, as as, as Tyler was saying. So uh, yeah, uh, we're recording now. I know there was a comment about that previously, uh, so we can share that as well. Um, all right, so I'm going to start sharing my screen. Uh, let's see how this works. All right, so can everyone? Oops, can everyone see this? Thumbs up, thumbs up, great, perfect, fantastic. So here's um, the setup. Uh, I might, um, yeah, I'm gonna leave this on for just a couple of minutes and uh, you know, maybe people, people don't mind just sharing this in the chat as well. 
Um, th this is all the information you need to get started. Uh, I suggest that you use Collaboratory. Uh, you'll probably need a Google account to, to use it. Uh, it'll have all the packages and everything. You don't have to uh, wrangle with Docker, but if you really want to, um, there's the GitHub as well. Uh, you can feel free to, to mess around with that as well. The notebook specifically is the NLP workshop notebook. We'll be working from there. Um, and the slides in PDF form should also be there. Um, so uh, just to give an overview, uh, what we're gonna be talking about today is we're basically going to be talking about some kind of basic techniques in natural language processing. Uh, we're gonna be going from raw text to informative vectors. And I'll talk a little bit about, more about what that means. Uh, but uh, my goal here is to make this more workshoppy than it is like a lecture, right? Um, and so I have some exercises that we can work on and try and do our best job to, uh, I don't know if the breakout rooms are gonna work. I've tried that before and sometimes it works. Um, but uh, I, I wanna make it a little bit uh, interactive, so feel free to break in if you have questions. I'll, I'll take breaks uh, for doing the exercises and doing the questions. Um, but, uh, you know, it, I imagine, you know, we have this uh, going until nine, but I imagine we'll probably wrap up in, um, you know, probably by about 8.30 or something like that for additional questions and things like that. So wherever we get to, we get to in this. Um, there's a lot of material and uh, happy to answer questions either, you know, after that around 8.30 for, for Q&A uh, or um, afterwards join the conversation in the Slack or just uh, get in touch. So uh, just gonna move on from here. Hopefully people have this open. A little bit about me. So I'm the Associate Director of Data Science um, on the Food Supply Chain Analytics and Sensing Group at MIT Sloan. Um, uh, my PhD is in policy analysis. I've worked a lot in natural language processing and you know, going from soup to nuts on a bunch of different projects. Uh, I have a website that has a little bit of my portfolio. Always interested in making new contacts in um, new projects and working with people. So feel free to, to get in touch uh, you know, on my website. Uh, on GitHub, Twitter, all those things. Um, so feel free to reach out. So let's get started about uh, what is the motivating reason for like why we should care about uh, natural language processing. And uh, I'd say the main thing is that there's been a lot of data growth and that's like what's driven a lot of the major innovations that you see in machine learning, that there's just a lot of more, a lot more information out there. And I love this graphic on the left because it's just like, and this is in 2017, right? This is already out of date. It's probably a lot more than that, but it's like every minute of every day, uh, YouTube, you know, they're watching 4 million uh, videos are being watched at one time. Um, the spam email sent, uh, Google um, has, you know, 4, 4 million searches being conducted every minute. This is a lot of information. And a lot of that information is not like just uh, signal, right? Like it's not just information that we can take and plug into a machine learning algorithm or like information that tells us something like intrinsically about uh, a user or about anything. A lot of this is unstructured data. A lot of it is, um, you know, images, it's videos, um, and it's text. Like in my experience, text is the, uh, the major data source that a lot of companies are dealing with. Um, and they don't necessarily know how to deal with this. And so the idea is you want to be able to, um, you know, get, uh, get your hands dirty with text data pretty quickly. And you can like for with very basic. So the basics that we're going to go over here, you can uncover a lot and we'll go over that a little bit. So what is natural language? Um, basically the definition of natural language is a language that has developed naturally, right? That's the kind of basic, um, but you know, that's in contrast to um, something like artificial language or computer code. Uh, I like just putting these two things side by side, like look at what natural language looks like and look what a computer code, this is just a Python for loop looks like. Python for loop is very basic, right? Or basic, very like uh, linear, right? It's very, um, if yes, then do this. If no, then do this. And you know, there's abstractions of course on top of that. Um, but uh, it is, you know, a, you can visualize it as a graph the same as you can visualize natural language. But natural language is a little bit more complex, right? We have this very simple uh, dependency grammar graph, um, which, you know, has some information in it, but not, definitely not all of the information that's contained within language. But you can see that it's a lot more kind of nuanced. There's a lot of uh, additional, like, uh, uh, you know, like these the parts of speech uh, are just sort of abstractions on top of it. So. The point of putting these things side by side is that natural language is, is very complex, as is computer language, but it's usually a little bit harder to say what is the, you know, if this word appears, does this mean, does it mean it's positive? If this word appears, does it mean it's negative? Things like that. Doesn't work as well 
uh, in natural language as it does in computer language. So uh, on that point, the, the early forms of processing natural language were basically turning them into computer language, right? Uh, this is from the 1950s. A lot of the, the problems were, this is for machine translation. Um, and it's kind of hard to read here, I guess. But the idea is it's a bunch of rules. So if you see uh, a certain word uh, followed by another word in within a certain amount of space, blah, 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 you, you build this entire essentially rules engine to do translation, right? You can say like, okay, now this word uh, means this. This is the subject. This is the object, stuff like that. Um, and it doesn't work particularly well because it's hard to take that very complex natural language and then put it into kind of a rules engine. So, you know, jump ahead to more modern techniques. And these are like deep learning models where basically it takes the information, it uh, condenses it down into an informative representation that has a lot of context, has a lot of nuance to it, um, and then outputs something. So this is also a machine translation model, uh, but this is a more modern machine translation, sequence to sequence uh, encoder decoder model. And you can see that it's, you know, I'm ext extracting around away all of the complexity here but it's, it's different from, uh, you know, things have changed a lot uh, in even the past few years uh, and definitely in the early days of, of natural language processing uh, when it was sort of uh, indistinguishable from just kind of uh, uh, rules engines and heuristics and things like that. Um, so now that we have this cool uh, technology that, you know, has these uh, informative representations and can do all these fancy things, we can do cool things like writing, write with transformer. And I, if you haven't heard of this, please mess around with it. It's so much fun. Like I put in, if you put in a seed, basically the model can complete the sentence or just continue writing just based on the information that you've given it, just on what words are likely to come based on the context. And so I just, the only thing I wrote here is I'm attending a PyData meetup on, and the rest was written by the model, right? And it's sensible, right? Like, you know, we don't operate Pacific time and uh, you know, it's kind of what is a Python application, but like it's, it's, you can, it's coherent, right? It's actually a, uh, a sentence, a complete sentence. We can also do cool things like this, which I actually might play. I think this is only a couple minutes, but it's a uh, Google assistant making a reservation. Can people hear this? If I play this, is this hearable? No, no. Okay. Well, all right, so the, 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 I definitely recommend looking at this, um, but basically it's a machine that is making a reservation and um, uh, uh, if I can just, so the person on the, the person that they call is an actual person who is responding, like how many people are you um, are res making this reservation for? And it's, it even like the, person on the other end of the phone doesn't understand what they're saying. There's like, uh, for how many people? And uh, the assistant even processes that and is able to understand like, oh, you're asking me again for this piece of information I already gave you. So it just, it just sounds very natural. And it's all, you know, the, the fancy techniques that exist in this area um, as of the past uh, number of years. And always worth discussing as part of this, like even though these things all seem miraculous and, and magical, uh, they are subject to the data sets that you give them. So if you give them a data set that has bias into it, it will learn that bias. Uh, and this is an example of uh, the association between um, the pronouns he and she and particular other words that are professional words. And you can see that captain is, is much stronger associated with he uh, than it is with she. Nurse is much stronger associated with she than it is with he. Uh, this is just one kind of illustration of um, some of the issues that exist uh, in uh, baked into, you know, the, if it's part of the, the, the data that you're giving to your model, it's part of what the model's going to learn. So um, are there any uh, thoughts or questions um, up to that point? That's sort of like a little bit of background, like where, where we're at. Okay, so I'll just go forward then. Um, so I just have a list of a couple of NLP libraries here, um, you know, not included are some of the deep learning libraries. Um, uh, you know, PyTorch is, is pretty powerful in this, in this area. Um, but, uh, we'll be focusing on Spacey, uh, and scikit-learn are the, the two tools that we're mainly going to be using. NLTK is something you'll see in a lot of tutorials. Uh, I think it's super powerful and it's really good for people who are doing like research that's like 
a lot more, mm, let's say like linguistics focused, a lot more like the choices, the, some of the design choices that we'll talk about uh, in this, in the course of this workshop um, are, uh, have a lot more functionality in NL2K, uh, but Spacey and Scikit-learn are a little bit more performant. And if you want to get, um, you know, do some exploratory data analysis pretty quickly, I find Spacey and, and, and Scikit-learn more useful. Then again, I've also coded a lot more in Spacey and Scikit-learn. So maybe if I had more experience with NL2K, I'd be recommending it more. But these are just some of the, the libraries that are out there. Uh, so uh, let's, we're gonna about to jump into the code. Uh, I think it probably makes sense to talk about tokenization first. This is the first step, right? Um, so we have, uh, you know, I don't, I don't have it like an example right here, but we have a text, right? We have any, you know, document, any sentence, anything. Um, the first step uh, is to take that, um, you know, string and break it into smaller strings, break it into useful units. Um, and so a token can be defined as basically a useful semantic unit. Um, a lot of times word and token are used interchangeably. They are different things. Um, and uh, even sometimes tokens are, are punctuation. Sometimes tokens are parts of words. Um, sometimes tokens are like special. They're not even words. They just are indicators of things. And we'll see some examples of that. Um, so Spacey is the one that we're mainly going to be using. And Spacey, uh, its structure is basically, it's, it's um, uh, organized around languages, around language modules. Uh, and so uh, in a particular language like English has a language specific pipeline. And in the base form, it just contains a tokenizer. It makes a bunch of design decisions around tokenization uh, that are abstracted away from you. So you don't have to really deal with that. Um, uh, more complex models, more models, the uh, other models might actually have a pipeline components, things like entity recognition, uh, dependency parsers, things like that. And we'll show some, uh, an example of a more complex uh, piece like that. But uh, in the base form, uh, text will run through this tokenizer and the output is a, a document, Spacey's version of a document. Documents are composed by spans, which are sets of tokens. And then uh, the individual tokens have attributes like, are they an entity? Uh, are they alphanumeric? All they, all they, all these other things. We'll mess around with that. Um, and so I just have this question at the end. Uh, you might, you know, Spacey does a lot of magic and it does it very performant. But Spacey makes decisions around tokenization that you might want to understand. And we'll see some examples of why that understanding and dis design decisions around that will sort of change things. Um, so we'll jump into the code unless there are any questions right now in here. Hearing none, I'm gonna move on. Uh, let's see if I can actually see my screen here. All right, okay. So um, check in real quick. Uh, is collaboratory or the code sort of working with people? I know it looks like the chat is kind of going, going mad here. Um, But for the most part, unless I hear differently, I'm gonna assume that people are at least seeing this or able to follow along in some way. Okay, thumbs up, thumbs up, fantastic. All right, so um, this is just to uh, ensure that the, um, the environment, uh, the kernel has all the, uh, the libraries that we'll be using, Spacey, Scikit-Learn, and Pandas. Um, so here's what I mean by the Spacey languages. Um, so uh, Spacey has a, a language uh, module and in that language module are a set of base uh, uh, languages. Um, we're using the English one mainly. Uh, I wanna just show an example with, uh, um, with Chinese. Actually, you don't end up needing to download this, which is interesting. Apparently, Colab already has this, which is weird. Um, but uh, so I just wanna show an example of tokenization uh, and how the tokenizer it differs for different languages. And I think Chinese is an interesting one, because if you run this, you'll see that uh, the English tokenization of a Chinese um, uh, a string is just to can treat this as like one unique token. It's like, okay, I don't know what this is. It's just one token, right? And then, you know, the, the punctuation. Meanwhile, if you use the, the proper Chinese tokenizer, it sees that these are different words. Again, I don't, I'm not a Chinese speaker, so I don't know if that's, this is particularly the right uh, tokenization to be using, but um, you can see that the, the it, it behaves a little differently. Um, so now we're just gonna talk about um, 
how you can basically make these tokens, right? The whole point here is to take a string like this Chinese string, or let's, let's go with an English string, right? Um, like this English string and turn it into a set of informative uh, semantic units, right? Turn it into tokens. And uh, you know, what are those informative semantic units are all a matter of design choices. And so now we're gonna talk about some of those design choices. Um, so uh, one of the things that um, sort of comes up in every tutorial is uh, uh, about lower casing, right? And base Python, you can just take a string and turn it into its lower case form. Um, Sp uh, Spacey has a similar, pretty simple way of, of doing this. And they do similar things. Um, you know, uh, obviously this is breaking it into ins individual tokens um, uh, based on the, the, the model. Um, and so that's just, you know, thinking about lower casing is kind of, uh, you, you might not just want to out of the box do lower, case, lower casing because for example, uh, you can see that now NLP is lowercase. Uh, lowercase NLP may have no meaning uh, to some models. So uh, we'll talk about entity recognition a little bit later, but it's a lot easier for a model to recognize an entity if the capitalization is intact. Um, but you also don't want to have things like uh, the, the we here, the capital W we here to be treated differently from something like, uh, and we enjoy it, right? Um, if, if you, uh, if you lowercase everything, the two we's are going to be treated the same. If you don't lowercase everything, um, then the this we and this we are going to basically be different units. So just just want to point that out, and that's going to be true throughout, right? Like thinking about what is a useful semantic unit is useful. Um, uh, handling non-alpha numeric text. So uh, in base Python, you might this is one way to do it, right? You can just take out anything that's not white space or um, an uppercase or lowercase uh, or a, a number. Uh, Spacey has um, a way of just removing if it's alphanumeric. But um, something worth um, noting, and I have that in the next cell, is uh, thinking about contractions. So when you try to remove um, non-alphanumeric characters from contractions, you get, uh, with base Python, you get we, uh, we are turned into were, um, and with spacey, it actually just drops the uh, apostrophe re entirely because that's not alphanumeric, right? It has a, has a punctuation mark. Um, so these are just points to show that thinking about how, the, how these things operate out of the box is important and will change uh, your result, right? You, 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 won't, you might want to treat contraction somewhat differently. You might want to expand it. There's a bunch of different strategies around that. So how does that, how does that sound? Are there, are there thoughts or questions on that? Cool. So um, I have an exercise here. We're going to see how this works, right? Um, maybe we take a couple of minutes. Um, I take a drink of water uh, and people try and create a tokenizer just based on what I have, right? You can just essentially, uh, if you really want to, just take copy the code that I have here and, and make a tokenization strategy here. Um, I have an ex like in the notebook already is my implementation, but uh, try and make your own implementation. And feel free to share questions in the chat or just speak up with a question. We'll do just maybe like a few minutes uh, to try this out, um, just to make it a little bit more interactive. So let's let's try that now. All right. Thanks for the insight. <clears throat> My name is Kupu. Um, so regarding the punctuation, where the meaning of the word can get changed if you were to. Uh, remove these punctuation. What is, what are good strategies? How do you deal with that with the word meaning doesn't change? Um, are you saying how you deal with contractions? Yeah. Yeah, so there's a couple of different ways of doing that. Um, uh, there's packages that automatically, based on a heuristic, sort of do this expansion. Um, if you uh, don't, um, if you don't, here, uh, Spacey will tokenize it in a, in a fairly nice way. And essentially, you end up with this token, which is apostrophe RE, um, which, is, which is fine, um, unless you want to do an expansion, then you might have to explore something like a, a contraction expansion. Thanks. Yep. Any other questions or thoughts? 
or ideas. I mean, I don't know if, if somebody has a way of dealing with the uh, contractions that's within space yet. I haven't really messed around with it that much. Yeah, but anyway, all right. So we'll take a couple of minutes. Feel free to try and, and make your own tokenizer. Um, and yeah, and then we'll jump back into it. All right, so let's jump back into it. Um, oops, here we go. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, I'll just go through. So I, I mean, I guess maybe does anybody uh, have any? Um, does anybody want to share their their technique for creating a tokenizer or any uh, or their thoughts on doing this exercise? If if there was anything that came up. Did this sort of work as, a, as an exercise? I have a couple exercises throughout and I just wanna make sure I give people time to, to complete them. It's a little bit easier if we're in person and we can like, you know, chat about it, but. All right, so let's just, we'll just, we'll just move along and feel free to break in if, if you have questions about this. I have three different tokenization strategies here um, uh, just to show off a little bit of the different um, uh, capabilities of Spacey. Uh, you know, we've seen the lower attribute from the different tokens we've seen is alpha. Um, another uh, neat um, piece that comes from the base model is just, is it like a URL? And that's just based on a set of regular expressions. Um, and I find it pretty cool to try it out. Um, you're able to detect that the particular token is a URL. And so if we take this tokenized lower alpha, um, URL and we take, uh, what's it called, text data. Um, when we run it, we get our sets of tokens for each of the different sentences. And in this case, the tokenize uh, that removes any URLs, uh, you'll see that it'll, it'll take out that URL entirely, right? It doesn't remove punctuation from it, it actually takes out the URL. Um, so uh, maybe you wanna change it so it uh, includes URLs and doesn't, um, doesn't treat them as individual words or anything like that. You might want to do that. So that's just one technique, tons of techniques. But again, this is design decisions and they, sort of, they will definitely affect your results. We'll see more examples of that as we, as we go forward. So um, I'm going to jump back into the slides um, real quick and uh, to talk about stemming versus lemonization. So um, has anyone heard of, of either of these techniques before, stemming versus lemonization? 
can't really see everybody here, but um, okay. Well, so it's it's something that you always sort of see in these tutorials. Um, uh, NLTK has a ton of uh, uh, an entire like stemming sort of area where they can do any kind of different stemming and and um, um, also has the capacity to do lemmatization. Basically, you know, the idea is we're taking this free text and we want to distill it into the useful, useful semantic units. And the idea is to get information that is uh, useful out of these units, right? Um, so it might not be useful to have a bunch of different forms of the word process or, uh, or be uh, or doing or stuff or something like that. You might want to treat them all the same. And so one approach to sort of uh, reducing them to a common form is uh, stemming. Um, another is, is lemmatization. So stemming uh, basically is just a set of heuristics. The idea is that it transforms um, words, uh, uh, usually the suffixes, um, into a more common form. And you can see the output of uh, pi stemmer um, here, where it says uh, he does natural language processing, gets uh, reduced to he uh, you know, does with the S removed, uh, natural language and processing with the ing removed. Um, so you can see that that's a little bit, uh, that reduces any instance of does into its sort of common form. Um, there's uh, other versions of this um, that I've, I've seen. I think a good example is, is taking something like uh, pony versus uh, ponies. Um, and a lot of these heuristic approaches will turn ponies into Pony, right? It'll take that plural form into into that form, um, but you know that's not really the same as as pony, right? Like those are those are, are going to be treated as two different uh, tokens. So something that might be useful in that case is lemmatization, and lemmatization is basically reducing a word into its dictionary form, into its like base form, it's the lemma, um, and that the the result of that process you can see here, where he is doing natural language processing becomes he be do natural language process, right? And so you can see that it, it transforms the word entirely, right? So is becomes be, becomes this, this lemma form, um, whereas stemming leaves intact most of the, the word, for the most part. Um, so it's, you know, it's a matter of, uh, uh, you know, you, you make the decision um, whether you want to do stemming versus lemmatization. Um, so uh, I tend to prefer to do, do lemmatization. Um, uh, just because of examples like that, where if the point is to reduce it to its common form, uh, I prefer to not have these kind of strange uh, tokens like a uh, pony with an I um, included in there. So I tend to use lemmatization, and Spacey has a nice implementation of uh, lemmatization, which I will show here. Um, so uh, remember I said that uh, Spacey has um, different kinds of pipelines, some that are very base and just have a base set of functionality some that are a little bit more complex and build other things into the pipeline beyond just tokenization. Um, this is a uh, you know, step up more complexity of English models. Uh, and you need that to enable, to, to enable you to do lemma because you actually need the dictionary form of these different words. And that's not in the base uh, English model. So uh, I don't know if, if this will work right out of the box. Sometimes it does with collaboratory. It's kind of sometimes magic, sometimes confusing. Um, but uh, so once you load this in and you use uh, that uh, model to run the text through, uh, you can see what comes out of it. And here uh, it takes the pronouns and turns it into the special pronoun token. Um, I'm not a huge fan of that, but uh, it, it's, it's something that is uh, uniform behavior. And so you can uh, guarantee that things like anything that's a pronoun is gonna be turned into something like that, right? Um, so. Yeah, so that's lemming, uh, lemmatization and, and stemming, or just uh, lemmatization with, with Spacey. Um, Spacey doesn't have stemming that I know of, uh, but I guess and that's another reason why I use lemmatization a lot more. Um, any thoughts on that? I know there's it's a wild debate about what is better, stemming versus lemmatization, and I don't, you know, it'll be a fun debate to have at some point, probably not here. I, I, had, a, I had a quick question. Sure. Um, if the text you're looking at contains slang um, and there's information that you want to capture in that slang, maybe to do, you know, kind of group people who have a similar vernacular, do you have a, are, are there pros and cons of stemming versus lamentization? And if so, what, what would be each? 
Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I don't know, does do people have a, a formulated answer to that or, or people have experience with that that they want to bring up? Um, so in, in my experience, it's, it is hard to, you know, like, um, one of the examples I've worked with is like text messages and text messages are a lot of shorthand and things like that. And there's a lot of, uh, heuristics, um, with, uh, involved in, in both methods. And so you might have it, uh, changing a, a token that it shouldn't be, uh, into a base form. Um, I'm trying to think of an example off the top of my head, but, uh, yeah, so lemma it's going to try and like take anything that it senses is not in its base dictionary form and turn it to its dictionary form and if that's like a slang that doesn't mean the dictionary form that it's being translated to you'll lose that piece of information um i see somebody has a question here tokenization keeps making nested list um uh so, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, right, yeah, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about actually creating a vocabulary in, in a little bit. Um, cool. Any other comments, thoughts? Sorry, just, just, <clears throat> just to follow up. Um, so, it sounds like if if you are interested in pulling information out of slang, you have to be very careful when you're using either lemmatization or or stemming. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll talk a little bit about, um, so this is breaking it down to very, very minute, uh, control over the individual tokens. Um, we're going to abstract some of this away and create vocabularies and you can do it a little bit more cleanly by examining your vocabulary or curating your vocabulary, right? Cause your voc vocabulary should be the informative, um, uh, the information that you're extracting from the raw text or the first level of information that you're extracting from the raw text. Uh, and this is, this is all just decisions you might make in designing your, your vocabulary. Cool. All right. So we'll move right along. Um, all right. So, uh, stop words. So let's talk about stop words. All right. So, um, stop words are extremely common words that have little information. So again, we're going back to, uh, this example. Uh, this this motivating uh, idea where we want to have uh, our uh, the information distilled from text to be as informative as possible. We want these tokens to be as informative as possible. Um, and so extremely common words have not a lot of information uh, in them. Um, and so you can think of the common words like the, and, from, and to. And there's not a canonical list of these stop words, right? Um, so there's uh, consequences to being too strict about them and there's consequences to being too broad about them. So in looking at this example uh, here, um, that in uh, May 2020, I went to a, a PyData meetup in Cambridge. Um, can somebody tell me what they think some of the stop words just based on that definition are? In, to, a. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. I. Yep, I is a good one, right? So that, that one I wouldn't think of off the top of my head, but uh, actually if you run it through Spacey's uh, set of stop words, I gets removed. Um, and I would actually say that I is pretty informative, right? So it's not I, it, you know, depending on how you define stop words is sort of a uh, question. Um, but, uh, but I actually does get removed in these stop words. So we're gonna just go and just show uh, essentially how Spacey deals with stop words. And you can actually just do this with the base English model. Um, and again, it's just a, an attribute of a particular token where you just say, if it's not a stop word, uh, or if it is a stop word, remove it, right? And so uh, what's interesting about this, to and A and I are removed, in is removed, as we've sort of uh, talked about. Um, may gets removed. Does anybody want to guess why May gets removed? Maybe the process doesn't see it as a month, but yeah. like, as in I may be able to do something. Correct. Exactly, exactly that. Um, so it is uh, case insensitive in, in what it's doing, right? So it looks up May, sees it in stop word dictionary and removes it or marks it as uh, the attribute is stop is gonna be true. 
So again, these are all just like gotchas a little bit, but they are design decisions and they will affect the, the outcome of, of what, you're, what you're working. So non-standard tokens is my word for all of the things that kind of don't fall into uh, you know, the stop words or the other uh, the pieces that I've already sort of talked about. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about named entities. So uh, the two things that I'm gonna show examples of are URLs and named entities. Uh, I, I treat them a little bit differently since URLs are, uh, uh, they don't really fall into the definition in my opinion of, of named entities. Uh, but they are sort of the special tokens into themselves, right? They, they aren't just a component of slashes and periods and things like that, right? They are something uh, different and should be treated, you know, you don't want to just, I mean, you can just remove all the punctuation and then just treat them as a big block of, of characters, which is fine. Uh, but then you, you get into issues like, does it have HTTP? Does it have HTTPS and things like that? Um, so with named entities, a named entity is basically a real world named object, like a person, place, or organization. Um, and the, the motivating thing here is that uh, New York City is not just uh, the tokens New York and City, right? Uh, the token New means something uh, in, in New York City means something particular uh, that is different from the word New as a new car, or a new you know uh, new class, or something like that, right? Um, so you want to be able to treat them as sort of uh, semantic units themselves, right? They're, they're inf and they have information just all together uh, in context, right? Um, and so there's a couple of different approaches to identify these. You might use just an inventory. Uh, you might use pattern matching, like, you know, if it's a first name, last name sort of thing. Uh, or you might use a, like an actual model that is trained to identify these things. So based on the definition that I've given right here, uh, can somebody just call out some of the uh, named entities in this statement? Uh, may. Hi, Data, Cambridge. Hi, Data, Cambridge. Anything else? Meetup, maybe. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I would say meetup as well, but interestingly, it won't appear unless it's like capitalized, which is getting back to that point before. Uh, it'll just be treated as whatever, its own thing. So what about May 2020? So uh, that actually, you know, I'm, I know the answers to the question that I'm asking. So it's, uh, um, but May 2020 is also a named entity in itself, right? The, we actually just saw an example where May was removed, right? Uh, because it was just sort of treated as May, as I may do something. Um, but May 2020 in its own, con in the context with May capitalized means something on its own, right? It's a particular date. Um, so, uh, so those, that sort of outlines what a, a named entity is. Um, so I'm going to show some code. Uh, does people have questions on like just the conceptual overview of it? Okay. So does somebody have a question? No, good. Okay, perfect. Um, so this is just an example of, uh, a couple of ways that you can deal with, uh, 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 URLs. We looked at like URL before, but here is a, a regex approach to it. Um, this is not particularly robust, so I don't recommend using it. If you're already using Spacey, why not use Spacey's um, built-in way? But um, just to show that you can sort of do this uh, in a, a regex-based way, just remove uh, the punctuation if it matches a certain pattern. And here I actually replaced it with um, replace the URL with like a special token, which is a consideration you might do, right? You might not want to just remove the, uh, the URL, but replace it with some kind of token that's going to be maintained. So with named entities, again, we're going to load this, uh, the small model, um, and uh, we're going to run it through the model, and we're going to get all the tokens out, and each individual token, uh, or the, the document itself, has an attribute that's called ants, and uh, it's basically a list of these different entities that have their own um, set of, uh, of information attached to them. So when you run it through, you can see uh, it goes, I am attending a meetup on Zoom, May 27, 2020. Um, Zoom, it identifies as a person for some reason, I guess Zoom is people. Um, and uh, it identifies this full uh, May 27, 2020 as a date. And that's an, like that entire thing is, it's a, is a named entity. And these, uh, this uh, spacey explain is really useful. It gives you 
an explanation of the labels, and you can use this for part of speech things as well. But in this case, it's just explaining what it means by a person or a date. Any thoughts, questions on that? Cool. So let's do another exercise uh, because they're fun. Um, uh, so we're going to take this text data again, um, and we're going to build a, a comprehensive tokenization pipeline. So your tokenization strategy that you already made uh, in the exercise before, you could probably just adapt it now to maybe do a little bit more complexity, right? Like maybe deal with stop, maybe just remove stop words, remove URLs, um, identify named entities, or something like that, right? Um, you can do a number of different things. I just encourage you to, to try it out, um, mess around with it. Uh, you can feel free to take the example that I wrote above as well and, and expand it. So we'll just take, say, uh, three, three or four minutes on that. Um, and then we'll just jump back. Feel free to ask questions in the chat or, or verbally. All right. Um, okay, so we'll jump back into it. Um, uh, any questions that came up or people want to share their discoveries or their uh, their solutions? Okay, so I'll just I'll just share mine. Um, so this is a little bit uh, elaborate. Uh, you know, I had uh small ambitions when i first tried to write this and, and ended up being a little bit more complex than i kind of wanted it to be um but the idea is uh it gives control over you know uh, what you want to do with entities what you want to do with stop words it includes all these things about lowercase uh alpha only, alpha numeric and, and alphabetization um 
uh, it's a little bit hard um, to deal with the entities because uh, I, I didn't find an easy way. And what I wanted to do is to be able to uh, replace the entities with uh, the type, the entity type. Um, and so that required uh, me looking at uh, all of the entities that were in, all the um, tokens that were in a particular span labeled as an entity and replacing all of those within uh, the, the uh, tokenization, the tokenized list. Um, so that was uh, you know, maybe not the best approach, but it's it, it added a little bit of complexity into my tokenization pipeline. Uh, but basically, um, for each of the tokens, for each of the documents, for each of the tokens, um, it'll go through. It'll uh, you know um, it can replace the URLs with the URL um, uh, token. Uh, it'll uh, basically collect entity information, and then uh, once it gets outside of that entity, uh, replace the uh, where the entity was with the entity type. Um, and do all the stop words and alphanumeric magic there. Um, so if we run this on all the text um, with all of these uh, parameters, uh, we get these lists of tokens. Um, uh, for entities as, as false, we want to replace all the entities, and um, that works like this. So we're limit limitizing everything. Pronouns become that special token. Um, entities become uh, their own sort of special token. Any thoughts on that? I mean, also, you know, if the people came up with uh, neat ideas for replacing entities, that's actually, I'd be interested to know, actually. So is entity extraction built in here? Sorry, say again? Is entity extraction built in here? Yeah, well, so we're, I'm using uh, Spacey's model. Uh, Spacey already has a, an entity recognition model baked into this uh, this um, model, this English model. Um, mm -hmm. And they have other languages as well. Um, but I'm just using that. Uh, and I won't go into the, the real details here, but individual tokens will have a tag for whether they are uh, the start of the token uh, start of an entity uh, inside of an entity or they're outside of an entity and mm -hmm. basically you can use that functionality to be able and to it does give you the entity type like whether it's a location or a person or yeah. A, yeah. and uh, if you were to combine stemming and lemma is that a good practice and if you were uh, to, if you were to do it in which order would you do it for stemming first lemma second i would not do them together I can't see a reason why that would, I don't think that would work as, as e either method is intended to work. But is, it's opinion. not a good idea to mix the two. I don't think so. I think they're both trying to get at the same thing. And I think that stemming changes the words intrinsically and limitization changes the words intrinsically. And so you get a little bit different things. I don't know if people have thoughts on that. I'm, I'm open to hear. Yeah, I've seen some five notebooks, if the LDA example where they do the PCA component analysis um, in the past, which had both stemming and lemma in it. I was wondering uh, if there was a bad practice there, or maybe I was misreading it. No, there's no, I wouldn't say bad or good practice. I, I wouldn't do it. It seems like um, overkill or not overkill. I mean, it just seems like, yeah, it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem like a reason to it to do it, but maybe for a particular use case that's appropriate. I'm, you know, I don't know. All right, so let's uh, move Wait, one, forward. Last so, one last question. Do you know how, sure, many, yeah, yeah. How, how many entity types are there in this uh, library? Like, is there like uh, fixed type gosh. five or 20 or is it like hundreds I, or is it like in tens? It, it's in the tens. Uh, it's not even in the tens. I think it's even, I think it's less than that. Okay. I think there might be six. Does anybody know? Uh, so I know there's like there's a geo there's like um, for the countries there's people there's dates there's um, yeah there's geo like uh, yeah I think there's only like five or six I don't know if people have no off the top of their head but it's it's somewhere right so um, looking at the chat right now cool uh, Stanford is org. Yeah, um, uh, this is one model, right? This is Spacey's base web um, 
trained on web. I forgot exactly. I think it's on Wikipedia. Um, uh, Explore them, especially if you're doing something scientific. There's something called sci spacey, uh, and there's a bunch of model, a bunch of language models uh, that are trained on um, that have specific entities for science. So, like you know, uh, chemical and uh, animal and things like that. Right. Um, this is a more you know all purposes uh, model, uh, but there's a ton out there. Cool. So. Uh, um, this was sort of a question before, like, all right, so we're, 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 you know, really digging into this, like creating of these tokens and essentially it's all a matter of designing essentially a vocabulary that you're going to use to represent your documents in some informative way. Um, and so one of the informative ways that you can represent your documents is by word counts, words uh, count over your vocabulary. Um, and so, uh, I'm just going to show, uh, a method to do that with, uh, Sorry, I'm just going to jump real quick. I want to make sure that I'm not skipping over anything. Yeah, I am skipping over everything. OK, perfect. Um, so uh, so what I was saying, the, the representation of documents across your vocabulary is uh, something that you could, uh, that is usually referred to as a document term matrix. Um, so this comes from uh, an, another field that's called information retrieval. Um, and basically, uh, there are a whole whole thing is to extract signal from noise. Um, and it's they have a, a whole suite of, of techniques that are very useful in NLP. Um, and basically just representing um, uh, these different documents in, in some informative way. And so as I was saying, uh, a document term matrix is your documents um, split across uh, your, your terms. So uh, you can see this illustration is, um, oh, I do not have this credited, I'm sorry. Uh, this is from a Stanford, this is from uh, here. Uh, apologies for that. Um, but also I encourage, the, this textbook is, is fantastic and is all free online. So um, anyway, so this is actually, I, they have a good illustration, but it's actually a term document matrix, but you know, you can just flip it and then it's the document chain. Just by looking at this, you can get some like useful information there, right? Julius Caesar and Henry V are, you know, focused on a lot of battles and war and stuff like that. Um, and so the the word battle appears a lot more frequently. And so just looking at this very simple representation, you get something useful out of it. Um, you can also do uh, cool things like term term matrix. Uh, that's particularly useful in word vectors, which we are not going to talk about. But it's essentially um, how often a particular word appears in uh, in other words, context, in other words, document. Um, and that's cool uh, because you can uh, see like very clear things like this. Again, this, this textbook is fantastic because you can, this is a really good example of um, digital and computer appear a lot together, but uh, digital and pi um, don't appear. Maybe if it was Raspberry Pi, it would appear, but it doesn't appear here. Um, but uh, so let's go back and jump right back to looking at word counts. Unless there are questions there, I can pause for a second. Do you have a question about the term term matrices? Sure. And maybe I missed something, but are these like, like co-occurrence? Two words occur together in the same document? Yeah, this one particularly is two words appear in the same document. Oh, okay, right. Yeah. Okay, sounds but, good, thanks. Yeah, in word vectors, in glove vectors, it's, it's this or uh, all with word vectorization, you might have a window, right? Like word, two words appear within three words of each other. And that's right. a little bit of a different um, measure. But this is just, this one particularly is just document, document. Okay, great, thanks. Um, cool, so, uh, so this is, um, we're just gonna initialize this. This is my simple tokenizer. We're gonna be using it just because it's simple. Um, and so we can uh, do some tokenization here. And so just to, to clarify what it looks like now, all of that work that we've done so far gets us to a nice, pretty uh, list of tokens. How nice is that? Um, and so you can use base Python to just get uh, word counts out of it. Uh, what is cool about these counter objects is that you can add them together and get a combined count. Um, so it's super fast and doesn't require you to pull in any scikit-learns or, or spacey or anything like that. Uh, and you can already get just the count uh, by these different um, documents of the different words. 
But I mean, in most use cases, you're probably going to want to pull in something that just does this without you messing around with particular counter objects. Um, and scikit-learn's count vectorizer browser is super powerful, super optimized, and, and very and very good for this purpose. And uh, you can get exactly the same thing that we got above uh, just by running this code using uh, plugging in your own custom tokenizer. Um, scikit-learn has its own. Uh, tokenizer if you don't specify a default tokenizer and that's uh, I believe just based on the um, word boundaries like just uh, white space between uh, between words um, and it does a bunch of other uh, it has a bunch of other defaults you can see them all here um, uh, and again so these are design decisions that uh, you might want to look into uh, if you want to just use scikit-learn and not try to build your own uh, tokenizer um, but this is another way to get to your word counts. What is cool here is um, scikit-learn, uh, by default, using its count vectorizer, outputs a sparse array, which is a particular data type. Um, and it's useful because in most cases, your vocabulary is going to be a lot, uh, uh, a lot larger than your, your document list. Um, and particular um, documents may not have any uh, instances of uh, particular items in your in your vocabulary. So it makes sense to represent it in a more compressed format where it's just like uh, most of the entries are going to be zero anyway. But this transformation gets you back to essentially the same combined count that we had before or that we have up here. Any thoughts or questions on that? All right, so I'm going to move ahead. Um, unless people yeah, I kind of want to. Uh, I kind of want to like maybe cut this to, or move to Q and A uh, around eight thirty ish. So I might just move forward unless people feel differently about that. Okay. Well, so this exercise is just you can do sentiment analysis uh, with what you have right now, right? You don't need a, a fancy, fancy um, machine learning model to to get some interesting things out of. Um, uh, the count vectorizer as you have them, right? Uh, you can just say how many times does the word good appear in these reviews? How many times does the word bad appear? And just to illustrate the point of if you are not lower casing them, which happens by default in the count vectorizer, you get a different count. And so your results already look different just based on the, those design decisions. So, okay, so we're gonna try this on a real data set because we're playing around with these little data sets. Um, a little bit too much. I have a subset of the IMDB, um, uh, a data set for providing DBA that has sentiment, um, positive and negative reviews. Uh, it is in the repo. You'll have to, in your collab instance, upload it uh, and then you know direct it to that data location. Or if you're running it at home, you're going to have to uh, change that data location. <coughs> is that working for any? Is, is anybody having a trouble with that? I just saw something pop up in the chat. It seems like a yes. Um, ooh, Cole Carson. Okay, sorry, there was an interesting comment, um, but I'll I'll get back to it. Uh, okay, so let's um, uh, let's just load that in. So we have about twelve hundred negative and positive reviews. Uh, we're going to run it through our count vectorizer and we're going to get the top 10 words. And how useful is that, right? What are all those words? Does anybody remember what, what those words are called? They're stop words, right? Absolutely. So, yeah, exactly. So, like, so we're running right now the negative reviews, right? And the idea was we wanted to look at the top 10 words uh, that are uh, in negative reviews and then compare it to positive reviews, right? And so what are we going to see? You're going to see the same thing, right? It's basically uh, filled with, there's too much noise in the signal, right? There's, um, there's a bunch of stop words and that's why we've made all the, the decisions and done all the work uh, before because we want to uh, try and distill it down to something a little bit more informative. So they're not informative about the content. Um, so we're going to do some things that make it a little bit more informative. Uh, we're going to use um, Scikit-Learn's own, uh, the Count Vectorizer uh, English stop words. We're going to use our same tokenizer 
um, we're also going to use these additional parameters that govern um, uh, how uh, whether um, words infrequent words are being included in the vocabulary or overly frequent words are being included in the vocabulary so that's min document frequency max document frequency so it has to appear in at least one percent of uh, the, the the corpus um, uh, and no more than ninety percent those pieces make sense to people stop word you can can you pass in your own array or in yeah. better can you pass does spacey have his own stop word yes um, I don't know exactly where that lives but yes you can pass spacey stop words or right you can just build that into your, your tokenizer to remove those this is just you know second learn has a way of doing it as well and they have, they're, they're, they're not the same, right? Uh, spacey stop words and scikit-learn stop words are not the same. So that's something worth considering. Uh, so when you rerun this, do we get something informative out of it? Um, yeah, sorry about that error. Uh, so uh, I would say that this is informative, right? Because, uh, sorry, this is not labeled, but it runs negative first and then positive. And uh, in the negative corpus, we see bad appearing in one of the top 10 words, right? In the positive corpus, we see great appearing um, in the top 10 words. We also see good appearing in both of them, but it's more frequent in, in uh, the positive reviews. So look at that. We just did sentiment analysis without any machine learning. Um, so that's, that's kind of cool, uh, just to show that you can do exploratory data analysis really cheaply, really quick. Um, so uh, any questions on that or comments on that? Yeah, it is machine learning though. You're done a fit transform. Yeah, right. I mean, I say it's not machine to, learning. <laughs> to the extent that machine learning is like a set of heuristics that you've sort of tuned and tweaked, yes, that's the story. Yeah, there's no hyper, I mean, these are all hyper parameters to that machine fit transform function you have been leveraged. Right, I guess, right. Um, yeah, you're not, yeah, you're, you're not like fitting a classifier to it, right? Like you're, just um, your your design decisions have gotten you to something informative, right? Sure. Without having to, and this is something you're going to have to do anyway, right? Even if you're going to pass this then into a classification model, you're going to have to have a, a, a vocabulary. So you know, this is not going to take the place of your classifier, but at least you've done already some exploratory analysis that gives you some idea if there's some signal that you can then probably build a classifier. On. Um. So stop words. Oh, everybody said stop words. <laughs> uh, okay, cool. Um, do you think it's a good idea to use max features? Um, yeah, you know, good, bad ideas. I'm not gonna say anything's a bad idea because um, then I'm gonna get in trouble. Uh, but uh, I, I think I like this min document frequency, max document frequency, because it logically, what you're trying to do is I don't want super rare words to noise up my, um, uh, data and I don't want super common words to noise up my data. Um, uh, yeah, if anybody's having trouble actually loading the data set, just make sure that you're going to. Uh, so if you're at this screen, right, you go to this little file manager and then you want to upload that pickle file. So that should, it, it's, yeah, it's, you'd have to upload it and if you let it sit for a while, it's going to disappear. Anyway, so we're going to jump ahead um and talk a little bit about so uh there are some issues with raw words counts and i sort of referred to them right you are saying min documents frequency max document frequency what like what level are you going to set those at like um you're going to probably have to tune that a little bit but really is that like a sensible way of doing it like generally in you know machine learning or statistics generally you you hard coding a bunch of like cutoffs doesn't, there's probably a better way, right? There's always a better way than that. Um, and so thinking about raw word count, we already saw that like without removing stop words, you get a bunch of noise. Um, and generally we wanna, uh, we don't wanna treat every word as the same, right? Cause they're, they're simply not. So think of the two, this example here where this book is about biology, this book is about history, right? Um, in those two expressions, can anybody have a, an idea of what is the most important, like if you had to pick one of those words in either of those examples, what would you say is the most important to uh, what that, that sentence is about? Book. 
Yeah, book, right. I mean, the subject is probably pretty important. But say you're trying to like, you know, uh, classify what topic, uh, you know, where to where to put this book in a, in a library. History versus biology are distinct. Right. Exactly. That's what I, yeah. So I would say that history and biology should be weighted as more important as is about this and, and even book, right? Um, so is there a way, a standard way of upweighting important words and discounting important, uh, unimportant words? And yes, the answer is yes, there is. Um, and that's term frequency, inverse document frequency. Basically, this is just thought of as taking your word counts and weighting them uh, according to how uh, informative they are about that particular um, document. Uh, and uh, it's pretty easy. Document frequency is the count of the number of documents in which a particular term appears. Uh, the inverse document frequency, sorry, I just put an N here, but it's the number of documents over the, uh, uh, the, um, the number of documents that that term appears in. And so you can imagine if that value is higher, um, then you want to give it a lower weight because it appears very common across. You can imagine the word the probably appears in every single document. It's going to have a pretty lower weight. It's basically just have a, a one weight. Uh, if it appears in only one document, then it's basically going to have the weight of N. Uh, which means it's it's exceptionally rare. It just pertains per to that document particularly, um, and so you can think of it as just you know upweighting the most informative words about that particular document. And then there's additional processing that goes on top of it, which I won't really dive into. But you know, the, to deal with situations where words never appear in, in, in particular corpuses, corpora, and things like that. Um, I think it's a little bit clearer in an example. I work better when I look at uh, it in a chart. Um, but as I said before, right, like Julius Caesar and Henry V uh, are about um, uh, wars and battles, right? And so the word, the, the weighted uh, term frequency, uh, the term for TF IDF value for battle in Julius Caesar is pretty high compared to fool and wit, which are not particularly that informative. Um, they don't really have that much to do with Julius Caesar and Henry V as battle does. You can still see the same stuff with like individual characters like Romeo, Falstaff, things like that. Higher uh, inverse document frequency. Any questions on that? That's a little bit of a complex idea that we're sort of diving into. I feel like I should be checking the chat in case people have questions. Yes, I appreciate everybody helping people with tech right now. That's, that's I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, Sorry, okay. I, had a, <clears throat> I had a quick sure, question. Yeah. Um, I, I might have missed this, but did you give like a formal definition for what vocabulary means in this context? It sounds like it might have something to do with word frequency, but I don't I want to make sure I didn't yep. miss that. <clears throat> yeah, so, sorry. I had like, um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't really formally explain what a vocabulary is, and I, and I, I should have. Um, Vocabulary is basically all of your tokens, right? It's your inventory of tokens. Uh, so when we were doing all that, like futzing around with tokenization and things like that, um, those are the things that you might, uh, that, the upshot of that is basically to uh, create this, um, uh, this count vectorizer in a, in a way that it can, uh, so there's two different ways that you can do it. You can fit it to your corpus and give it some parameters in which it'll create that vocabulary. Actually, I don't know why I'm pointing at it and not just showing you exactly what, what comes out of it. The, the term vocabulary that I'm using, actually, I'm just stealing from uh, scikit-learn, right? So you can actually access this vocabulary. Oh my gosh, sorry. Uh, okay, yeah, you can access this vocabulary. And these are the, the index and indices for those different vocabulary words. Um, and so by fitting it, um, and I think Kupu referred to this by fitting it, basically you, you gave it these parameters, um, you gave it this tokenizer and it's going to create this vocabulary for you. Um, before this is fit, it doesn't have a vocabulary and you can, a really cool trick that I've, I've messed around with before is, uh, to give it its own vocabulary, to predefine a vocabulary for it. So let's just call this a, right? And so now it's a count vectorizer. If we ask for its vocabulary, it's going to say, uh, I don't have a vocabulary, right? It's going to give you an error, actually. Um, yeah, I think it'll just be none. This is none, right? So because you haven't fit it or you haven't specified a vocabulary for it, 
it doesn't it, it doesn't have a vocabulary. So once you fit it, now it has a vocabulary. Does that make sense? So in the case where you want to give it your own vocabulary, meaning you want to, is it an inventory of tokens or will it be an inventory of dictionary words? Uh, it's inventory of what you expect to find out of your tokenization to, uh, function, right? I can't pass it an English dictionary or a finance dictionary or a biology dictionary. You can, yeah. But it, those but won't be in it, tokenized form. They, do I have to tokenize those biology dictionary or? Right, so it, it depends, right? So you're expecting when you pass it a vocabulary, you're expecting that when scikit-learn applies the uh, tokenization that you've specified or its default tokenization, that it's going to find those exact like words that you're giving it in that vocabulary. If it does not find those exact words that you've given in the vocabulary, it will basically just give, like it'll say like zero, right? Like that, doc that document has no loading on any element. So there, if you pass in your own vocabulary, then tokenization can be harmful. Uh, well, I wouldn't say it's necessarily harmful. It's like, it's a, a choice that you make, right? By specifying vocabulary. So I've used um, count vectorizer when I'm looking for particular uh, tokens, right? It's actually a really neat way of, of searching for a particular token. I've used it, this is particular in one example, um, I've used it with Chinese text, right? And I've passed it, um, the tokenizer from a library that's called Jiba that does this sort of uh, tokenization for Chinese characters. And I was looking for particular um, uh, uh, tokens or sets of tokens. Sorry, I'm jumping around a little bit, but something I don't really touch on um, is that uh, you can, a token could be multiple words long, right? And so you could say, my vocabulary is uh, this word, this word plus this word, you know, it's Bob, it's Bob Dole, it's Bob, President Bob Dole or something like that, right? Like it's, I don't know why I picked that. Sorry for that example. Um, but, uh, you know, you can you can use it in, in a number of different ways. It's very flexible. So sorry for, for asking one last question on the same topic. Sure. So president, would, when I run the word president through token, would I not get two different uh, tokens for other word president, pressy, and then maybe something along? No, no, unless you're, unless your tokenization does something like splits it up by characters. Okay. Okay, thanks for the question. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, okay, so yeah, let's uh, move ahead. So this is um, uh, the count vectorizer, uh, and I just turn it into a data frame because it's easy to visualize. And then uh, there's TF IDF vectorizer. There's some math there. This is because um, scikit-learn does some uh, additional magic uh, that's not just as simple as N over DF. Um, and you can see very quickly, we just see that uh, uh, in this set of documents, we would say probably good, bad, and great are the most informative words in any given sentence. And you know, we see that they have the highest uh, uh, term, um, document, inverse document frequency weighted term frequency uh, out, of, out of all of the words. Cool. So um, uh, this is an example. So. Let me see. Uh, okay, so I'm not gonna go actually into this exercise. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go just lightly over um, topic models, because it's a pretty huge area, but I wanna at least touch on it so that uh, folks can look at the slides at home, mess around with the examples and feel free to ask me questions and things like that. Um, uh, I just don't know, I don't know if we're gonna have the time to, to go in extensively to them. Uh, so let me just touch on them pretty briefly. The idea is uh, with topic models is, you know, hey, we have these informative vectors, but they are document term uh, matrices, right? They're a distribution over the entire vocabulary that we defined above. Um, probably it makes sense to, to distill that information a little bit. Um, uh, doing that not only kind of constrains our feature space a little bit, but likely uh, each individual uh, token is not uh, that important, but there's some information shared between these different tokens. And that is sort of the idea of what Topic Models is trying to do. It's trying to basically discover these, these major themes um, that pervade this uh, unstructured collection of documents. So this is a quote from, from Blay. Um, so uh, the idea is that a document is a function of a set of topics. Topics are a function of a set of words. 
Um, and uh, I'm going to uh, get very complicated very fast real quick, but uh, a lot of these topic models can be uh, broken down into the idea of just, I'm just gonna actually let's get straight to this. Um, taking your data and representing it as a distribution across different archetypes. So instead of vocabulary, now we're, we're looking at uh, individual archetypes and those are, can be defined as, as uh, you know, principal components. Those can be defined as topics. Those can be defined in a, in a number of different ways. Um, and I highly, highly recommend uh, this um, talk by Leyland uh, McInnes um, because basically he turns uh, all of these different models into uh, matrix factorization problems with different loss functions applied to them. Uh, and so, uh, but the, the general idea, um, and he lays this out really clearly, is that um, these sets of techniques are essentially trying to find these lower dimensional representations of the individual documents. Uh, and those lower dimensional representations in the context of topic models are considered, are called topics, or the, you know, a, a set of, uh, the, a set of um, uh, uh, archetypes that have uh, the individual words of the vocabulary weighted in some way uh, across them. Apologize for all of the hand waviness. I just want to kind of like dive, uh, dive into it, go to the, to the code a little bit. So, so people have, um, material to, to work with. So um, I don't really dive into LSI here, but LSI is essentially um, uh, an adaptation of principal components for, uh, for text information for um, uh, document uh, term uh, matrices. And non-negative matrix factorization is essentially just uh, this LSI, but with a constraint that all of the loadings across the different um, archetypes have to be positive. The idea being that it uh, makes more sense to have a positive loading on a particular topic rather than a negative loading. Like what does a negative loading on a topic mean? It's kind of hard to interpret. And then the other example that I'm just gonna be going through code for is latent Dirichlet allocation. This is an extremely complicated uh, idea that is very well explained in this article uh, linked to here. Uh, but the idea is that each uh, it it kind of goes back to this idea that I talked about before, that individual top, uh, documents are um, uh, the result of a process of uh, a sort of generative process where an individual, uh, you can imagine that like to create the words in an individual document, you are selecting a set of topics that are what it's about. And then those, those topics have uh, certain um, sets of words that are representative of them and those words then create the document right so that each document is a generative uh, model from words to topics to, to documents and i'm not going to even touch on this because this is super complex uh okay so let's just go to the code so we can touch on it at least lightly um <clears throat> i have this function just for displaying components i found this a very useful utility uh for looking at the results of these um topic models uh, and so we're going to initialize the TF-IDF vectorizer and account vectorizer. We're going to run uh, those um, through um, uh, non-negative matrix factorization and latent Dirichlet allocation. Worth noting, uh, latent Dirichlet allocation wants count vectors. Uh, that is because of the certain assumptions of the, the generative model of LDA. So just I've no, seen people make that mistake before, but it's worth noting. So I'm just specifying, I'm pre-specifying a number of components, a number of topics here. So running that takes some amount of time because LDA is a little bit slow. Um, you get uh, these individual components, which are uh, across your vocabulary. You have some measures of how well uh, the solver sort of did at finding these archetypes. Um, and then you can just display these components using that, that function that I had before. Um, <clears throat> which, uh, so now you have these 10 different topics and you have the words that are, have the highest loading on those individual topics, the words that are most representative of that particular topic. Um, Non-negative matrix factorization here works uh, a little bit well. I've just seen it work better generally, but you can see kind of a cool thing here where topic number seven seems to be talking about reviews that are for um, adaptations of books. And then topic um, number nine 
is it seems like it's talking about uh, horror effects or um, uh, horror movies particularly. And I don't know if uh, people see other ones. So that was Warp Speed, apologize for that. Um, but I wanted to make sure to leave ample time for questions, thoughts, and discussion. Um, hey, Ben, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. Uh, I have a question. Uh, like when you input a file, suppose I have a paper and it has introduction, abstract, discussion, different sections. I want to apply different rules to each section. Can I do that? Um, different rules as in different vocabularies? Or? Yes, yes, exactly, yeah. Uh, or yeah. different stop words at different uh, uh, sections. So like, is it, is it possible? I, yeah, I don't know if do, do people have, have thoughts on that. I, I, can, I can think about that for a second. Okay, thank you. I would have to break it up <clears throat> and run separate analysis, all abstracts together. Okay. All details together, all summaries together at the end, all conclusion sections. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, Google. Yeah. You could also, I mean, you could fit your vocabulary to every single word depending. Yeah. I mean, it, it doesn't seem like, depending on like how if you're dealing with like a small, you know, small corpus, uh, you, you could just probably take every individual word that appears and then you know, uh, do some exploratory analysis there to see like what words are most likely to appear in certain sections or subset your uh, document term matrix in some way to mess around with that. Um, mm -hmm. I think it depends okay. on your, what you're trying to do. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Sure. So using this code base here, and looks like you've got you know topic modeling. Uh, and you have you could build many more features. In terms of scale, uh, you're using very little of your RAM. I don't know how big a computer it was, but how many documents? And you give us some idea about scale, number of documents, how big the vocabulary, and uh, just to give a sense of uh, scalability and performance. Yeah. So it depends. I mean, these things, all of these things that I've shown you so far are extremely like light computationally, right? The thing that, you know, you might run into is if you have a huge corpus or you're using every single possible token or every single possible character in, uh, in the corpus, then you might, uh, start, things might start exploding real, real fast. Um, but these strategies, uh, I haven't found a, a use for having every single character. Um, I haven't even particularly seen a use for using every single word. Um, I don't know. I think compared to some of the state of the art NLP stuff, this is very lightweight what we're working with here. Um, so I don't foresee much problem. I, I see this as very eminently scalable, right? Like you could have this on an isolated, uh, like a mobile device or something like that. that could run without a uh, problem. You get in, you run into problems when you're dealing with large architectures that you have to with tons of parameters thrown in there. I don't know if people have thoughts on that as well. In terms of uh, my thinking, you know, if I was to take this your code here and train it on maybe 500 documents or 1,000 documents or 100,000 documents, so that I can predict maybe the good or bad that you showed or what topic is this a document belongs to. If I was to use this kind of a, a tool set for predicting topics within a document, and I had to train it, what would be my training set? How many, what, how large can I, my train? And if I have infinite data to train, how much can this code base handle in a single node scenario? Can I pass in 500 megabytes, 100 megabytes? I think it depends. It's very dependent on your uh, the the resources that you have. Um, I, again, these are lightweight things that I'm, I'm, I have here, but things need to be tuned to your specific needs, right? And you can make a lot of choices to cut down on the complexity. Hey Ben, this is Sandy. Um, thank you for the wonderful presentation. I have a question regarding to you know uh, the, one of the cases I'm 
actually in. So I'm trying to, you know, um, going through the uh, topic model for some of the survey data I have and the also survey that have like, you know, tax things because, you know, people will, you know, freely ask some questions regarding to some of the tax, tax questions. So I wonder like, it's after this, you know, topic modeling, is there anything else I can do, you know, because based on like, for example, based on the sample here, it looks, yeah, like definitely we can extract some useful information from the nine topics here, but like, is there anything else that we can do to cross validate or, you know, to like further on, like beyond this, like, is there anything? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, uh, there's, whew. There's so many different uh, directions you can go. This is these are useful features. So if you have um, uh, any sort of labeled information, you can use these as informative features in a classification model and run things through it that way. You could um, do uh, um, some amount of so like there's there's measures for how I don't know if this sort of answers your questions, but there's measure for how well this uh, model is is doing. In terms of, of fitting these the, the 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 topics to your to your data or reconstructing the data from the topics that it's it's generated, and so you can see by doing a bunch of different uh, design choices, a bunch of hyperparameter uh, tuning, see if you can reduce this reconstruction error, um, and then you you know that you're having pretty informative uh, uh, features. Um, it, this is usually for uh, unlabeled data, but you can use it to enhance uh, uh, labeling. You can see, you know, based on this lower dimensional representation, you can do some sort of clustering. And then with your limited labeled set, you can say like, okay, uh, all of the, the positive labels fall into this cluster across these um, topics. Uh, and so I can probably say, okay, anything else that's in this uh, uh, cluster probably also is a positive class or a positive class with, with some probability. So for this, Does that answer like, your question? Topic, yeah, yeah, definitely. So for this, like, uh, topic modeling, I can kind of have some, like, manually input into this model. For example, uh, these two look similar. I, you know, will conclude them as one topic instead of two or three. And then will that be another input for this model? Sorry, I haven't used this, but I'm just, <laughs> you know, considering, like, <laughs> whether it's possible to do that, like, you know, yeah, I mean, there's, you know, there's so much creativity that you can do with it. These are, these are informative reference. Like, if I, I'm going to get a little bit, uh, go a little bit overboard here, but if I was going to explain all of natural language processing in one word, it's basically taking text and turning it into representations. And that applies to the most advanced transformer model and to a word, word count, right? So uh, you can use a lot of the pre-trained models sort of out of the box. Um, even the most advanced ones will basically give you a representation uh, that is just a numeric representation that a machine can then make use of for a classification model. Or you can, uh, we, didn't, we didn't talk about it here, but you can do similarity type measures between those different vectors. Um, so the answer is you're getting features out of this approach and you can do, you can add more features, you can concatenate them, you can do you know, a number of different things. Sounds good, thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, are there other thoughts or, I mean, open to? I had a question um, about going back to the, um, the dictionary attribute that was available after you used the fit method. So, um, yeah, so it sounds like, it seems like there's, there's a dictionary for each in your loop, each feature in your data frame. So what if you don't have, so what if it's like a situation where it's not supervised learning, where you don't have features? Um, in that situation, does it make sense to define a vocabulary or how would you go about, I guess, identifying if you had multiple vocabularies or how do you even define a vocabulary in that situation? Well, so this is all unsupervised, right? I didn't actually make use of the the negative or positive labels that are that are here. It, it yeah, I, I was just using them to say like, do we get some discriminative information? Uh, I see, I see. So it so that grouping it came up with on its own, and then you. Sorry, yeah. So I, I'm obviously confused. Can you go over that part yeah, a sure. little bit more? Yeah. Um, so this yeah. piece particularly, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. 
Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, I mean, I, I split it. I thought it was interesting to look at what you can do without even fitting a model to it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but right. Yeah. I mean, like I, I have two separate corpuses, right? But you could think of an example where you have two separate corpuses, like the uh, documents that came before a certain date and documents that came after a certain date. So like, um, trying to think of an example, like, um, uh, before somebody declares their candidacy for president, I don't know why I'm, I'm set in, in presidencies here, um, and, and after in news articles, right? Um, and seeing like what words appear uh, uh, alongside this particular person's mention versus uh, prior to this period, right? You don't really have a, you, you don't really have a supervised learning problem there. You just have a before and after. And mm -hmm. you can just see from exploratory analysis, oh, the word president appears a lot more uh, after they declared their candidacy than before. Um, so, so what if in this particular situation, your negative and positive reviews were in one corpus? Yeah, I mean, I think that what would, uh, so, I mean, I think there's a ton of different approaches. Um, I think, uh, you know, you, you have this distilled set, you can still run this whole thing without, um, you know, I, I ended up fitting this entire topic model on all of the reviews. Uh, yes. So I just basically took all of the reviews. So these are all the topics across all of the reviews. Um, so uh, it, it would be neat. I don't think it, it would have come out if one topic was negative, right? Um, but you could, you know, in, in, in sort of top down investigating these, maybe these are things that only uh, you find uh, uh, some discriminative, um, if you do like a clustering, right, unsupervised approach to clustering, you find that uh, all of the negative reviews tend to appear in this set of clusters and all the positive reviews appear in this set of clusters. So you can do some sort of like uh, labeling like that or some sort of uh, curation like that. Got it. Got it. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, of course. Yeah. And these are all, it's all like, I wanted to make a, like a diagram, but I didn't get a chance to where it's just like how noisy is the data and how much it is like a art versus like a, like science so like if you have a very structured data set like a lot of these models are trained on like question answering data sets they're super structured right um and then it's just a matter of optimizing on top of optimization right but like when you are just entering into a problem where you just have all of this this like data uh, and you have no idea what to do with it then it's all really a matter of like what am i trying to do what works things like that it's a little bit more nuance. So it's not like a wrong approach. There's just different approaches. Hey, hey, Ben. Sure. Uh, great presentation. Thanks for letting me in. Um, you know, I'm interested in this McInnes, uh matrix factorization thing you talked about. But when I go to that link, it goes to a thing on dimensionality reduction. And I was wondering, I can't seem to find the matrix factorization video or talk is it yeah uh it is uh i am i am uh the uh, let me just make sure that the link is correct because <laughs> uh, it looks interesting both of them do actually yeah uh, yeah i mean it's, a, it's super fast it's, it's extreme um yeah uh he talks about matrix factorization in as uh, a dimensionality reduction uh technique Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, any other thoughts, discussion points, considerations, ideas? Cool. Well, Good I mean, enough. we can continue. The, sorry. Does somebody have a question? Have? Yeah. Thanks. Yes. Um, that is, is there a way? Um, like when you do cluster analysis, you can use silhouette width and things like that to figure out how well your clusters have been created. Is there, are there topic models that have a similar, um, uh, let's see, um, kind of metric for each one of the topics they created, like how well they work? Um, for a particular topic you're asking. Yeah, yeah. You said they, they have it for the whole thing. Yeah. Um, whew. I, I imagine you could redo the reconstruction error, just hard, like mm. just 
mathematically and just like force it to only use two uh, topics or one topic or whatever. Oh, okay. That's just my thought. There might be a better way of doing it. I don't know if people have experience there. Yeah, I, you know. No, that's, that's good. You, you, I think you also said that um, you might use these features to create clusters. And then once you're there, then you have the metrics that I'm asking about. Anyway, that sounds good. Yeah, 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 right. If how, how well they hang together. Yeah, that's, that's true. Like how discriminative these different um, topics are. Yeah, that's a good point. Cool. All right, well, unless there's other questions or, you know, feel free to reach out. Um, uh, we'll just uh, close it here. Um, I don't know, Tyler, are there any things you want to close out with? Yeah, Ben, just wanted to definitely say thank you. I think this was awesome. A lot of great content. Um, so just wanted to definitely tell folks, please go on to Ben's GitHub and reuse some of this information and reach out with any questions. Um, so all of that will, will be uh, in the content. And uh, the only other thing that I think we want to give a shout out for is the meetup that we have coming up next month. So just a reminder, uh, please go on our meetup page definitely get connected on our Slack, um, Slack channels to stay up to date about what's going on. And folks, if you're interested in presenting something, definitely reach out. Um, and as well as if you're interested in getting more involved with organization, uh, right now that we're remote, um, organizing is a little bit, uh, I would say easier. So I think uh, I definitely encourage you guys uh, for, if you thought about it before, definitely try to start to get involved now. Um, we'll be here. Uh, hopefully every month through uh, this virtual new virtual world we're experiencing. Uh, so definitely again, big shout out to Ben, uh, phenomenal content, great stuff. I have a lot to cover now <laughs> over the next few days. Thanks, Tyler. All right. Thanks everyone. Thanks for coming. Thanks for being Thank you. active participants. Thank you, Ben. It was wonderful. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you. you, Ben. Bye. All right. Thanks. Fantastic, guys. Thank you. Thank have you, Ben. Have a good night. Bye-bye. <laughs>